I was sitting here this morning thinking about when COVID first came along and uh, I had to come here and there was nobody here and I found that really really difficult to preach to an empty an empty room uh, even though I realized that there were going to be many people watching the the tape it was still difficult to do so I really appreciate the fact that we have a number here today I think there's 14 of us in total uh, but that's better than zero so it's really good to see you this morning uh, I was reminded of a, a joke I heard one time with regards to uh, a pastor that I got up to preach and there were only about five people in the congregation but he got up and he preached his whole sermon and he was quite long-winded. He ended up preaching for probably 45 minutes or an hour. And, uh, and when he was done, he met one of the gentlemen at the back that was there and uh, the, uh, some comment was made about the length of his sermon. And he mentioned that, well, it doesn't matter how many there are, you have to feed the people that are there. Uh, but the guy made the comment, yeah, but you don't have to give them a whole load. <laughs> So I'm going to try not to give you the whole load this morning. I'll try and uh, kind of adjust things a little bit for our context. Uh, I would feel much more comfortable if I just took the whiteboard and put it down there and I put some marks on there and did some teaching this morning. So I'm going to try and kind of adapt to our, to our context a bit this morning. We are going to read a portion that we have read a number of times. And I'm going to read a portion of it today from Romans chapter 5 and I'm going to read verses 18 through 21 Romans 5 18 through 21 so then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men even so through the act of one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men for as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray before we look into the word this morning. Father, we ask that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit as we consider the words that are before us. Father, we pray that you would just use this time to encourage our hearts in our relationship with you and give us a deeper understanding and appreciation of what you have done for us in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> we've made it basically through chapter 5 of Romans. Uh, you remember that the book of Romans started with an introduction in chapter 1 verses 1 through 15. And then the theme was uh, brought forward in Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 and we tried to memorize those verses. The theme has to do with the righteousness of God which is made, made available to us uh, as sinners. And then in verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, the unrighteousness of all mankind was, was presented to us by Paul. And then in chapter 3, verses 21 to chapter 5, verse 21, we've been talking about the righteousness which has been imputed to us, uh, which has been given to us and placed to our account. And that righteousness is a free gift uh, apart from the works of the law. It is something that we receive by faith, and we've been over that. And now we're going to be entering into chapter 6 through chapter 8. And in those chapters, we're going to be looking, about, looking at the whole issue of how this righteousness which God has given to us is imparted to us in our practical experience, in our everyday experience. And so I'm going to kind of try and introduce that a bit this morning. Uh, we have... Uh, then in chapter 5 uh, verses 1 through 21 for the last two or three weeks and one thing that we notice as we have dealt with this portion is that there is a oneness with Adam 
that is spoken of very, very emphatically. There is a oneness that we have with Adam, and there is a oneness that we have with Christ. And we read about that this morning. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Now the reality is this, that when God views us, He views us in relationship to all of humanity. He doesn't just view us uh, in isolation from humanity. There is a solidarity that's spoken of in the scriptures when it comes to the human race. And we are viewed by God as being in Adam, and we are also viewed by God when we turn to Christ in faith, we are viewed by God as being in Christ. So there is a solidarity. Uh, you see this in the Old Testament in a couple of notable portions, and one is in Joshua chapter 7. You remember when uh, uh, Joshua led the children of Israel and the city of Jericho was taken. Uh, you remember the story how they marched around the city seven times and they broke their laps and they shouted and the walls of the city fell down and they conquered that city. Well, all of the things in that city were declared as under a ban by God. They were not supposed to touch them, they were not supposed to take them. And uh, there is one man who disobeyed that. His name was Achan. And Achan took some of the forbidden things and he hid them in his tent. Well, the story continues on that the children of Israel were going to take the city of Ai. And so Joshua sent some men there to find out uh, what the situation was basically. And they came back and said, you shouldn't send everybody there because it's a very small city and uh, we should be able to do it with a limited number of personnel. So that's what they did. They went to attack Ai, and uh, lo and behold, the children of Israel were defeated. The men of Ai came out and fought against the, the uh, forces of, of Israel, and they defeated them, and so Israel ran uh, from this conflict. And when they got back, Joshua started praying and he fell on his face before God and was wondering exactly what was going on. That's kind of my version of the story. And God said to him in verse 11 of chapter 7, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. And they have, and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. So the word of God came to Joshua and he says to Joshua that Israel has sinned. The reality is that it was Achan that had sinned. But when God spoke to Joshua, he didn't make a distinction between Joshua and the entire nation, uh, or between Achan, I should say, and the entire nation. God viewed the nation as one, uh, not as a number of individuals in isolation from one another, but he viewed them in a solidarity. And so then when Joshua confronted Achan, uh, Achan said this in verse 20. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I have done. And he confessed to what he had done. So Achan confesses his sin before Joshua, but when God is looking at the situation, God doesn't look at the sin of Achan in isolation. He looks at the nation of Israel, and he says that when Achan sinned, the whole nation sinned, because there is a solidarity. And that's important for us to understand that, because that is what happens when Adam sinned. There is a solidarity with Adam. Uh, he is not just simply an individual, but in Adam is contained the entire human race, and God views mankind in Adam. And so when Adam sinned, God views that as the whole nation having sinned. Um, 
And that, I left that orange on my desk. Could you go and get that? I want to use that for an illustration. Uh, the whole issue is that when Adam sinned, we all sinned in Adam. And it's very, very important for us to understand that. I'm going to take an orange, and Annette is going to bring that to me here. And I want to illustrate it kind of with a simple illustration. And I think Elaine used an illustration similar to this when she was talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit being one, but consisting of many parts. Here I have an orange, and I don't know if you can see it, but I've written the word Adam on there. And this is Adam, okay? But if you peel the... If you peel the, the peeling back on this orange, which is Adam, you find that it consists of many different pieces. Uh, this could be me, this could be you, this could be someone else, and every one of these pieces would represent another individual. So when God views us, he doesn't view us as a number of individuals. What God sees when Adam sins and Adam rebels is God sees the entirety of the human race contained in Adam. We all sinned when Adam sinned. And uh, because of that, the death that came to, uh, came into existence, the death that came into existence through Adam was passed on to us. Now, I want to just take that <coughs> basic thought, and I want to develop it a little bit today and talk about this whole, na this whole issue of the sin nature which was passed on to us through Adam. I discovered in my studies that in the book of Romans, in chapters 5 and 6 and 7, the word sin is used 38 times, so it's a significant word in this portion of scripture. But in all but one usage of that word, in those 38 times, all of them are in the singular, not in the plural. So the word is not sins, but the word is sin. Sin in the singular. And that is important to understand because the singular is emphasizing not the multitude of, multitude of sins that we commit, but the singular is emphasizing the sin nature, the reality that sin exists in the heart of man. There are not many sins spoken of, but simply one. And that is referring basically to the sin nature. If you look at chapter 6, 1 through 6, you can see that very clearly. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And then verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So that word sin is referring basically to the sinful human nature. Now Paul portrays this sin nature that abides with, within man, not simply as a uh, dormant, uh, a dormant condition, but he refers to it more as a power, such as a king who is ruling as a tyrant. Uh, and so he is talking not about sin simply existing within the heart. He talks about it in the sense that this sin is like a king who dominates our life. It is an active power. St. Thomas Aquinas who, if you are aware of any church history, will realize is a very, very influential theologian uh, and probably extremely influential in the Catholic theology. Thomas Aquinas said that original sin merely wounded the human nature. He said that sin stains us 
and makes us guilty, deserving punishment. And it is like an illness, uh, some sins being curable and others not, or others being mortal. And so you come with that whole belief system that there are mortal sins and there are venial sins, and it all stems from that. The reformers, however, took a little different approach and perspective when it came to this matter of the sin nature in man. They believed in the total depravity of man. And you've probably heard that term used. It's, a, it's not a very complicated term. It's very simple, actually. It doesn't mean that man is as evil as he can possibly be. That's not what that means at all. It doesn't mean that there are things that man does that are... Uh, it doesn't mean that there are not things that man can do that are good and beneficial and helpful and beautiful and that sort of thing, creative. Uh, what total depravity means is the simple fact that every part of man's nature has been affected by sin. The depravity is total, it is complete, it affects my mind, it affects my emotions, it affects my will, it affects my body, it affects every facet of my being. So the depravity of this sin nature is total, it affects everything uh, that makes me up as a person. The I th and I think that the reformers are right in that perspective because of the fact that you look at the terms that Paul is using here. He talks about sin as reigning. He talks about us being slaves to sin. And he talks about us in chapter 7 of being in bondage to sin. And uh, the whole idea is that this sin nature affects who we are in every part of our being and every part of our personality. Well, what is the sin nature? What exactly is involved when we're talking about the sin nature? I found a little statement by Oswald Chambers, I think, that helps to clarify it a bit, and I'd like to use it and build a few thoughts from this. He says this, that the Bible does not say that God punished the human race for one man's sin. Now, I may take a little bit of exception to some of the things he says here, so when I read this, don't read this as I agree with everything that Oswald Chambers was saying. Uh, but there is one thing here that I do agree with. He says, but, but the disposition of sin, namely my claim to my right to myself, entered into the human race by one man, and then another man took on him the sin of the human race and put it away, uh, an infinitely profounder revelation. The disposition of sin is not immortality and wrongdoing, or immorality, I should say, and wrongdoing. But the disposition is the disposition of self-realization. I am my own God. This disposition may work out in the decorous morality and the indecorous morality. By that he's saying it may manifest itself in the respectability of a man who considers himself righteous, but it can also manifest itself in the, uh, the disposition or the depraved condition of a man who just lives according to the, the, whatever his desires might dictate. When our Lord faced men with all forces of evil in them, and men who were clean living and moral and upright, he didn't pay any attention to the more degradation of the one or the moral attainment of the other. He looked at something we do not see, namely the disposition, the inclination of the heart. Then he says this, sin is a thing I am born with and I cannot touch it. God touches it in redemption. In the cross of Jesus Christ, God redeemed the whole human race from the possibility of damnation to the heredity of sin. And God nowhere holds a man responsible for having the heredity of sin. The condemnation is not that I am born with the heredity of sin, but if when I realize that Jesus Christ came to deliver me from it, I refuse to let him do it. From that moment on, I begin to get the seal of damnation. And this is the judgment, the critical moment, that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. So the sin nature 
has to do with the disposition or this, the, the inclination of the human heart. I want to turn back to Genesis and I want to show you what happened in the fall. And I think this helps us to understand this whole issue of the sin nature. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about the temptation and Satan coming to the woman and uh, tempting her to eat from the forbidden fruit. And uh, we read this, The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, what you see happening here in this particular portion, I believe, is that the temptation was a temptation with regards to desire, even more than it was a temptation to partake of the fruit. Because you notice what happened when Satan tempted Eve. It says that she saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. So the desire here was stimulated by Satan, and it was a desire for something that God had forbidden. And so then the moment that Adam and Eve ate of that fruit and gave in to the temptation, they gave in to the desire. And the thing that changed in the makeup of man at that particular time is that their desires went south. <laughs> their desires became unclean. And so then you see, and this is one of the most tragic portions of scripture when you read it understanding that it was the desire for something other than God that is at the core of sin and then you read that God came in verse 8 they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden and that is the tragic scene of the consequence of sin you see, God had built into Adam and Eve a disposition that longed for Him. They're moral creatures. They were made with a sense of rightness and wrongness built within them. And they were seeking the right. They were seeking God. There was a desire for Him. That was a disposition in their heart where they desired God. If you think about something, for instance, that you really like. Now, I like chocolate and I like sweet chocolate, okay? So when I talk about, when somebody talks to me about chocolate or Hershey's bar with almonds in them, my mouth waters, okay? It stimulates in me a desire. There's a desire for that candy bar. Well, in Adam and Eve, there were desires that were created. But these desires were pure and holy. The desire that governed their entire life was a desire for God, a desire for that which He wanted. It was a desire for that which He willed. It was a desire to know Him. It was a desire to walk with Him. That was built into them as creatures. And that desire was holy. It was pure. It was given by God. And what happened when Adam and Eve sinned is they said, there is something that I desire that is better than God. And that was the temptation. The temptation was not necessarily the fruit of that tree. The temptation was this, that there is something better that God is withholding from us. And so the desire then was for this thing that God was withholding. And the moment they reached and took that fruit and ate of it, they gave in to the desire and the desire for God died. And you can see it because God appears in the garden and now they are not running to Him because that's what they desire. They are running from Him because they have rejected that desire. And so you have a corruption in the heart of man that enters into the very makeup of his being that affects the way he thinks, the way he feels, the way he speaks, the way he acts, 
And that defilement is that now I no longer desire God, I desire what I want, and I become the center of my universe, not Him. I believe that this is really, really important to understand. Selfish desire, selfish desire, is at the heart of the sin nature. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, I want to read that verse for you. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. We read this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now notice what Paul does here in this verse. This is what I want you to see. He says, I would not have come to know sin, not sinning, but sin, this sin that abides within us, this sin nature. I would not have come to understand sin, the sin nature, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. When I understood that I coveted, then I understood what that sin in me was all about, is what he's saying. So coveting is basically epithumia in the Greek, it's intense desire. And it's used a number of times by Paul in his epistles. So what he is saying here is that this sin within me has something to do with this coveting, this, this desiring things. And the coveting is at the core of the sin nature. It is the desires of man that have gone awry, gone astray. It is a desire for self. It is a desire for the things I want, not a desire for what God wants. We see this again, if you look in the book of Ephesians, for instance, in chapter four, verse 22, we see the connection again between the sin that's in us and the desires. Verse 22 of, of Ephesians four, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with what? In accordance with the lusts. That's the same word that Paul used for coveting. According to the lusts of deceit, the deceiving lusts relate back to this old self. Now there are terms that are used in the New Testament. They're not synonymous, but they're all connected. The old man, the old self, the sin nature, the sin in us, those are all speaking about the same basic issue. And Paul uses this term old self here that is being corrupted and it's being corrupted in accordance with the lusts, the desires. It's the desires that have gone astray. It is the desires that have gone in the wrong direction. It is the fact that I desire myself, the things I want, the things that are important to me, and I no longer desire God. That is the essence of the sin nature. We find that again in Ephesians chapter 2, if you look back at that portion, 1 to 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children, or the sons of disobedience. Then he says this, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the rest. We were by nature the children of wrath, and he defines that nature when we indulge in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The very same word again, that epithumia, the desires have gone astray, the desires are wrong, the desires are pointing in the wrong direction. So that is the essence of the sin nature within us, and that is what we struggle with. And if we don't understand that, that we have these desires, they're in us and they are alive. They're not dead, they are alive. It is still there, even though I become a Christian and uh, my sins are forgiven, and God the Spirit comes to live in me, and I am born of the Spirit, I have a new life within me, that old man still exists. 
those desires that want to lead me astray are within me and they are very very strong they're powerful Paul speaks of it as a tyrant <laughs> a king that wants to reign my life and that's what he's going to be talking about in chapter 6 7 and 8 in the book of Romans he is going to be talking about how the power of those desires is broken so that we do not have to live according to the dictates of those desires that are still within me those desires do not have to be king in my life they do not have to direct me they do not have to control me that power has been broken at the cross and so in Romans 6, 7, and 8, which we are going to begin to look at in the days ahead, Paul is giving us the answer to how do we live a life that is not controlled by the sin nature, by the perverted desires which still remain within us. It's crystal clear in the scriptures, I believe, that when a person turns to Christ, there is a major shift and a major change that takes place in the life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we read that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away, the old new things have come. We are a new creation when we turn to Christ. And I believe that one of the key elements, the central element in that new creation is the existence of new desires. You see, desires are to change when we turn to Christ. Selfishness is to be replaced with a hunger for the things of God. Peter says that in second in first Peter chapter 2. He says, As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. One thing that bothers me, and it bothers me deeply, is that I know of many people who say that they have turned to Christ, but they don't long for him. There is no yearning for him. There is no passion for him. There is no pursuing him. He is just another compartment in our life. I'll tell you, when you turn to Christ, and when you are born again, when the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, something radical takes place. The old man dies, and there is created in you a new man. There is a new nature. And one of the Telltale signs of the reality of that new nature is that the desires now shift from me to God. I desire Him. I long for Him. I pursue Him. Remember what David said? I believe it's Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You see, that's what happens when a person turns to Christ. Our heart begins to pant after God. There is an offering of the desires and the longings that exist within us. Not that the old man is annihilated. He no longer exists. We live with two natures now. We live with the old nature and we live with the new nature. And the new nature is supposed to dominate and is supposed to control. There was a native fellow, an aboriginal fellow, who, was, who had become a Christian. And he described his Christian life in terms of that he understood. He says, you know, it's, he said, my, my life now is like I have two dogs in me, and they're fighting against one another. There's the good dog and there's the bad dog. The bad dog is the one I used to be, and the good dog is the guy that I want, God wants me to be. And somebody asked him, well, which dog is winning? He said, the dog that's winning is the dog I feed the most. <laughs> that's the reality of our walk in Christ. If you keep feeding the flesh, 
If you keep pursuing your own desires, if you keep pursuing your own way, you have no longing for God. There is no growth. There is no development. There is no power. There is no change. When we submit to Christ, when we submit to the Spirit, and when we long for Him and we pursue Him, and at the heart of that is pursuing Him through truth, through His Word, when we begin to devour the Word, then that new dog gets stronger and stronger and begins to take over. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And we pray that you would take these simple thoughts and use them, Father, within our hearts and lives to draw us to yourself. Father, we pray that our prayer might become as David's prayer was. Create in me, O God, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Give us, Father, that panting after you that David knew. As the deer pants for the waters, O oh God, may our souls long after you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.